This lecture is the third in a series about the thermodynamics of phase change. And in this lecture, we're going to look at how a calorimeter is used. This is a picture of a calorimeter here. This is a very common one that's used in a chem lab for high school. It's called a coffee cup calorimeter because it's made with uh, styrofoam coffee cups. It's very cheap, it's very easy to use, and it's not actually too bad. The point of the coffee cups is the coffee cups are very insulating because they're made of styrofoam. And the point of a calorimeter is it's a device that's used to calculate energy. And it comes from the term calorie, which is what we use to measure energy. So a calorimeter is used to measure energy, but it's not measuring energy itself. It's, it's measuring the change in temperature. So if you have a calorimeter, the calorimeter is going to be made of some sort of an insulating um, sort of a vessel or some sort of container. Usually that contains water. The water is going to have a thermometer in it, so the calorimeter is used to look at the change in temperature of the water. And then there's usually some sort of a stirrer or a mechanical stirrer, and sometimes there's a little container on the inside in which you can put chemicals if you want to do a chemical reaction. So the way a calorimeter works is when a reaction or a phase change takes place, the water that's in the cup is going to absorb the energy from the system. If it's an endothermic system, then the cup is going to, the water in the cup is going to give away or release energy. So either way, the temperature is going to measure the change in the water's, the thermometer, I'm sorry, will measure the change in the water's temperature. So because the mass of the water in the calorimeter cup and the change in temperature of the water and the CP or specific heat of water is known, we can then use this formula to calculate the amount of energy that was absorbed or released by the water. According to the law of conservation of energy, the amount of energy that was released by the system or whatever type of reaction you're looking at is going to be equal to the amount of the energy that's absorbed by the water. And this is, again, because energy is being conserved. So this is also making the assumption that no heat energy is going to be lost into the, surround, into the cup or into the surroundings. So it's very important that your calorimeter have some sort of a lid on top, or else, as you know, if you have something hot, the heat is going to just leave right out of it. So the calorimeter is um, a very insulated container to, main, to, to really minimize the energy lost. If you then know the mass of the substances that you are reacting, and you know what temperature they were at and what temperature they ended up, so you know the change of temperature, you can then use that information because we already know the energy that was given off by the system and the mass and the temperature, and you can calculate the specific heat of the system. Let's look at an example of this. As we talked about in previous lectures, different substances have different heat capacities. And what that means is that a different substance is going to require more energy to raise it to a certain temperature. For example, if you have a piece of copper, and you use the same mass of copper, and you apply the same amount of energy to it, it'll turn the copper to, um, it'll raise the copper by a certain number of degrees Celsius. However, that same amount of energy applied to a, maybe a, um, a chunk of silver, that's the same mass as the copper, is going to raise the temperature of the silver by a lot more. So we saw that in a previous, um, in a previous lecture. So let's look at this. This is an example of a calorimeter. It's not made of a coffee cup, but you still have the basic calorimeter shape of a lid and the, um, the container, and you can see there's water in here. And this is hooked up to a thermometer probe rather than a thermometer. So let's first use copper. And let's just use 20 grams of copper at 20 degrees Celsius. And if we add it to 30 grams of water, and that water is also 20 degrees Celsius, let's see if there would be any change in energy. So when we graph the temperature of the water, we see that the water is remaining constant at 20 degrees Celsius. This makes sense because the kinetic energy of the metal is exactly the same as the kinetic energy of the water. So energy is going back and forth, but there's going to be no increase in kinetic energy, which we would see as temperature. So let's reset this and let's make the copper um, 200 degrees. Okay, so instead we're going to use the same mass of copper and we're going to heat it up to 200 degrees. And let's see how that's going to affect the change or the temperature of the water.
So now we see that the copper is transferring its energy into the water, and that is causing the water to get much warmer. I want you to try and remember this, the uh, basic the slope of what this, um, this graph is, because we're going to compare this to a different metal. And different metals are going to be able to release and absorb more energy based on their specific heat. They've also given us the, given us the, the specific heat of the copper. Um, we could have calculated that because we know that the beginning temperature of the metal was 200. Its ending temperature now is at about 30 degrees where it's reached thermodynamic equilibrium with the water. We know the beginning temperature of the water was 20, and it is now ending at, again, 30 degrees at thermodynamic equilibrium. And we know the mass of both substances, and we know the specific heat of water. So we could have calculated the specific heat of the metal. We could have even identified the metal by its specific heat. So we could have had an unknown metal, and as long as we know this other data, we could have identified that metal by its specific heat. Let's reset this, and let's look at the same mass, but let's look at a different metal. Let's look at silver. Well, again, we'll set it to 200 degrees, and let's see how the um, change in temperature of the water compares to the way the temperature changed with the metal. So if you remember that previous graph, it had a much steeper slope. This mass, this, um, the silver has a much lower slope, and we can see it's going to reach thermodynamic equilibrium at a much lower temperature. So what that means is that the, um, the specific heat of the silver is a much lower number. So it required fewer joules per gram of the silver to change its temperature, which means it has fewer joules of energy to give off to the water. So even though they were the same mass and the same temperature, the copper and the silver, are allowed to or are able to hold different amounts of energy within them, and that is because they have different specific heat values. So this is how a calorimeter works.